Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Ahmad Lotfi. Uh, I'm uh, the professor of renal surgery and colorectal surgical department. Today we are going to talk about the colorectal polyps and polyposis syndromes. Uh, by the end of the lecture, we ought to know different types of colorectal polyps, the pathology of the commonest types and their malignant potential, the presentation of colorectal polyps, and what are the investigations to be done to diagnose colorectal polyps. The management of colorectal polyps and the surveillance plan is mandatory for the treatment and the polyposis syndromes and their management differs greatly from the solitary or multiple polyps. In the colorectal segment, the colorectal uh, lesions are either benign or malignant. The benign lesions are the benign polyps, which we are going to study, and there are many other lesions that are less frequent but they should be put in mind uh, because they mimic in the symptoms and in the appearance colorectal polyps. These are the lipoma, submucous lipomas, hemangiomas, benign gastrointestinal stromal tumors or GIST, the lyomyomas, and endometriosis. Well, the presentation of colorectal polyps are either silent or patient may present with bleeding per rectum, either fresh or altered blood, according to the segment where the polyps are present. And if the polyps are pedunculated and are located in the lower third of the rectum, there may be a prolapse of the polyp during defecation, especially in babies and infants. Uh, well, uh, these are the presentation. We'll study now the management of benign colorectal lesions. All lesions should be totally excised and submitted to histopathology. So, we will know that these are a precancerous lesion or it is a benign or a malignant lesion, then the treatment will follow accordingly. Pedunculated lesions, usually these are polyps, are removed by colonoscopic polypectomy, which is a, a minimally invasive procedure and not a burden for the patient. Cessi lesions, if small, can be managed by endoscopic piecemeal excision. These uh, Cessi lesion should be uh, carefully removed and totally removed. If not possible by this method, a resection may be required, operative resection. Low rectal lesions near the dentate line can be excised by transanal excision if feasible. Transanal excision, the patient will be in the lysotomy position and dilatation of the anal orifice will be done to dilate the sphincters and the polyp and the lesion is pulled outside the anus and is excised and the base is, uh, the, the defect is sutured. Before studying the polyps, we have to know the colorectal cancer pathways. Most of the adenocarcinoma of the colon and rectum are uh, uh, on top of neoplastic polyps or adenomas. So this is the adenoma carcinoma pathway. This, the uh, Lynch syndrome, which is a muta mutation, uh, it is non-polyposis cancer, that can cancer carcinoma develop in a flat on top of flat mucosa. This is three to five percent, so it is not so common, but it is an important pathway. 
The recently, there is the serrated pathway. What is the serrated pathway, which is responsible about of about third of the cases of carcinoma of the colon and the rectum? It is polyps with a, patho a histopathological uh, uh, criteria of serrated, serrated uh, surface. So this is also uh, a new pathway known recently. This diagram will show us that all the types of polyps, whether it is solitary, multiple, or it can be in a polyposal syndrome. The commonest and the most serious and most dangerous because it is a neoplastic and precancerous is the neoplastic polyps, which are in three types, the tubular adenoma, tubular villus adenoma, and the villus adenoma. Then the hyperplastic metaplastic polyps. These polyps are very common in elderly people, above 50 and 60. Many patients done routine colonoscopy will find small lesions and when these are removed and uh, pathological uh, histopathological study is done, it, it is proved to be metaplastic or hyperplastic polyp, which was uh, known uh, that it is not a precancerous lesion. But recently, some of these polyps are having the serrated histopathology and they are precancerous. So this goes with the rule that any lesion found in the colonoscopic examination should be retrieved and removed to be studied histopathologically because it may be either an aplastic polyp or a serrated hyperplastic polyp. Another group is the hamartomatous polyps. These hamartomatous polyps are uh, characterized by the uh, abnormal arrangement of the layers of the polyp. You may find the in the submucosa, muscularis mucosa, not in the same order and the arrangement is haphazard and abnormal. The pro two prototypes of this hamartomatous polyps are the Perth-Jager syndrome and the juvenile polyps. All these polyps, the neoplastic, the hyperplastic, and the hamartomatous polyps, you can find one, two, three, multiple, or you can find hundreds of them in the polyposis syndrome. The same pathology is in the old, old polyps and they should be managed accordingly. The last group of polyps are the inflammatory polyps found and seen in the schistosomal polyposis. Sh uh, patient have schistosomal colitis. In uh, some uh, stages, he will develop inflammatory polyps. Uh, this is rare nowadays, but the, the commonest inflammatory polyps are those seen with inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and these polyps are called pseudopolyps pseudopolyps because they are formed by regeneration of the mucosa after the uh, ulceration of the colon and the healthy mucosa in between the ulcers will regenerate and they are not true polyps what is the serrated polyps recently discovered? These are three types, and they are responsible for, uh, in most of them are benign. These are the hyperplastic polyps, not precancerous. We have the sessile serrated adenomatous polyps and the traditional serrated adenomas. These, they uh, are precancerous and are, uh, they are responsible for about third of cases of the colorectal carcinoma. Before going into the polyp subject, we have to know what are the high-risk patients. Who are the, hi the high-risk patients for developing colorectal carcinoma? These are old age persons, more than 65 years, and patients with positive family history of colorectal cancer, patients with history of colorectal cancer, so if they had an operation for excision of a colorectal cancer and then they are 
three times more prone to develop another colorectal metachronous cancer. Also patients with familial adenomatous polyposis, these are have these patients have like in the picture hundreds of adenomatous polyp polyps and these are all precancerous so they are more prone to develop carcinoma uh, of the colon rectum. Patient with hereditary non polyposis colon cancer. It is five uh, around five to seven percent the of these patients and they are responsible for colorectal cancer also on flat mucosa, on top of flat mucosa, not polyps. Patient with inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are more prone, especially if the disease is long-standing and especially also if it is aggressive. Also, the pa patients who develop the inflammatory bowel disease early in their lives, they are more prone to develop cancer more than those developing a mild condition and those developing it uh, after 40 years of age. Also, patients having sporadic neoplastic adenomas. These patients will have, may have cancer more than the normal population. We come now to the neoplastic polyps. These are the adenomas. The, we have the three types and their incidence are as shown. The tubular adenoma is more common. The tubular villus adenoma, which is a mixture between the tubular and the villus adenoma, is the next. Then the rarest and the most serious is the villus adenoma. It is important to know that the size of the polyp is correlated to the degree of the villus component. So the smaller polyp is usually a tubular adenoma. The bigger polyp, when it is more than one to two or two centimeter, it, the villus component will be more. And it is by the, the biological behavior of this villus uh, lesion and the malignant potential increases. The malignant potential increases with the increase in the polyp size, the increase in the villus component, and the increase in the degree of dysplasia. Dysplasia is a very important term for you to know. It is the abnormal cytological changes at the nuclear level. So there are changes at the nucleus making this cell dysplastic cell. It starts by a mild dysplasia, then moderate, then severe dysplasia, which is, uh, which is uh, earl the early cancer. Severe dysplasia is very close to the cancer. It is not cancer, but it is in the previous years, it was called carcinoma in situ. Now, the term carcinoma in situ is uh, not used, and we, we use the term severe dysplasia. So, the dysplasia in a neoplastic polyp increase in the size of the nucleus is a dysplastic feature. Also, other features increase in the mitotic figures in the nucleus, increase the pleomorphism in the nucleus, and increased hyperchromatosis. The dye, the deep, deep, deep depth of the stain is the hyperchromatosis. Uh, when dysplastic cells spread beneath the muscularis mucosa, this is called invasive cancer. So the dysplasia starts in the mucosa above the muscularis mucosa, but the cells, when they spread beneath the muscularis mucosa, this is called the invasive cancer. So a polyp is either benign with certain degree of dysplasia, mild, moderate, or severe, or malignant containing invasive carcinoma. The, the incidence and the malignant potential of the adenomas are as follows. The tubular adenoma, which is usually smaller than one centimeter or not more than one and a half centimeter or two, two centimeter, is less than 5% because it is having it criteria of the benignity. When the villus component starts to enter and it, it becomes the tubular villus polyp, the, this have 20% risk of being ca uh, cancer or it will change to cancer at one time. 
the villous adenomas have the highest malignant potential of around 35 to 40 percent. Well, the genetics in polyposes and polyps are very important because there is what we call the adenoma carcinoma sequence. This sequence starts by in the flat mucosa, changes to adenoma, then it will change by time to a carcinoma. This is uh, uh, acquired by specific inherited genes and acquired genetic abnormality. So it is either inherited from the, the parents or a new mutation occurs to this baby or this person and it will develop uh, the polyps uh, and the polypose. Uh, mutation points are often present in the KRAS gene. Such mutations are very common in carcinomas. So genetic studies prove that in the KRAS gene uh, it is present in cancer of the colon and rectum and also in big adenomas and are very rare in adenomas smaller than one centimeter which is not going to turn to cancer. The familial adenomatous polyposis is a syndrome. It is a genetic syndrome and it is the commonest of the several genetic conditions called genetic adenomatous polyposis syndromes. This is the familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP. There, is, there are other subtypes, the Gardner syndrome having extracolonic uh, lesions and other uh, types like Turcot syndrome with brain tumors and so on. These polyposis syndrome, the patient have hundreds of or thousands of adenomatous polyps in the colon. It is the result of mutation in the adenomatous polyposis coli gene, APC gene. 80% or more of these patients will develop colorectal cancer if left untreated because all these adenomas have a, a cancer risk more than 5%. So if they will have thousands of them, of the co uh, of polyps, so this patient will definitely have carcinoma of the colon and the rectum before the age of 40 years. Although these syndromes are responsible for only a few percent of colon can cancer in the general population, the, re the recognition of these cases is essential for cancer prophylaxis in the patient and his family members. Well, we have the familial adenomatous polyposis and we have also the an attenuated. The familial adenomatous polyposis studied in the last slide is uh, inherited by the autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. So half of the patient, if the, a mother or a father will have the uh, polyposis gene, he will transmit it to 50%, at least 50% of the offsprings. Okay, it is inherited by the autosomal dominant gene. But we have also attenuated familial uh, uh, dominant polyposis and what we call also MYH polyposis. These are two rare conditions in which there are less than 100 polyps in the colon, not hundreds, less than 100. And in the attenuated family adenomatous polyposis and the MYH polyposis, uh, the mutation on the APC gene or the MYH gene is different because in the, fo in the familial polyposis, it is uh, dominant, but in the, uh, here it is recessive. So the individual needs to inherit one mutation, muta one mutated gene from each parent to develop polyps. Okay, so it is in a recessive pattern. Please note that in the book of the surgical department, our book, if you have it, page 160 160 you there you will find in the second paragraph number b because we ha uh, it is subtype in of the famous polyposis syndrome the the first a familial adenomatous polyposis on the page 159 but in 160 you will find the title hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer this is 
uh, to be replaced by the previous slide the uh, the uh, you you, you yes, uh, we, we will uh, you, so you please write b instead of b hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer you will write the uh, the previous slide okay so it will be corrected and the in the next uh, publication we will correct it for you now we have the adenoma carcinoma sequence the evolution of the carcinoma from adenoma it is start it starts from a normal colonic mucosa then as a, a mutation a new mutation will occur uh, or a specific inherited gene will change this flat mucosa to mucosal hyperplasia and this will shift and change to adenoma formation this adenoma will grow a villus pattern will will uh, will ca will uh, uh, occur and dysplasia will start mild moderate severe so we will have at the end of this pathway invasive carcinoma usually this takes from about 5 to 15 years so this 5 to 15 years is a very good time for us to study an important time lapse to study in the surveillance protocols later on how did we know that this uh, time, uh, the 5 to 15 years, this period is uh, the time to be changed from the, the start to the cancer? Because some p patients were, uh, have had uh, this uh, polyps and they refused to have either an operation or to be removed. They refused treatment, but they were followed up. So they started following them when an adenoma was found less than one centimeter till carcinoma develops uh, and uh, this time was never less than five years and usually it was 10 to 15 years okay these are colonoscopic pictures of some polyps this is a tubular adenoma notice the head like a mushroom and uh, the head is slightly darker than the neck and the stalk and usually when the polyp is small it is sessile but when it increases in size the heavy the weight of the head pulls with it a normal mucosa stoke and it is called a pedunculated polyp this is a polyp having surface uh, uh, villus pattern uh, uh, in the surface and it is a tubular villus larger than the previous one and it is uh, uh, having a narrow uh, short uh, having a short pedicle not a narrow pedicle these three pictures show the different types of villus lesions velvety velvety sessile lesion on the left side uh, irregular uh, soft lesion and a very uh, this is in the middle and on that on the right side will find irregular mucosa and when it is biopsies it is it will show villus pattern a malignant polyp may not be different in shape from the adenomatous benign polyp but it is definitely larger definitely the uh, uh, color of the uh, head is darker but the stalk may be normal like the previous one so this goes with any the rule that any lesion should be, rem be removed to if it is a polyp or a sessile polyp, it should be submitted to histopathology to know its nature. How to manage malignant benign neoplastic colorectal polyps? Before going to the management, we want to, to summarize how to diagnose the polyps. So the clinical picture, bleeding, prolapse may be present uh, and Sometimes the patient will have colics if a big villus or a big pedunculated polyp is in the transverse colon, which is the mobile segment. This patient may have recurrent polyps. So bleeding, prolapse per rectum, recurrent polyps, and a rare condition in patient harbor harboring big villus lesions, he may have excessive mucus production because the villus polyp or polyps will produce more mucus. 
So this will be uh, a fourth rare presentation. In patients having familial polyposis coli and polyposis syndromes, they will have bleeding, colics, and excessive mucus production, and sometimes diarrhea. Diagnosis will be by colonoscopy, and sometimes it is seen and diagnosed by virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography. CT now can do a three-dimensional uh, uh, pictures, very similar to colonoscopy, but uh, yeah, it is uh, for patients refusing to do colonoscopy, we can do for them virtual colonoscopy will show the polyps. So it is either colonoscopy or virtual colonoscopy. In the past, barium enema with air contrast was done. Not to forget the genetic syndromes, so family history is very important. And also, we have to know that uh, a polyposis registry should be done for all positive cases with positive family history to have to study all the members of the family and to manage them properly. Now the management of benign neoplastic colorectal polyps, we, we will have some rules. Polypectomy should be done for all polyps to achieve what we call a clean colon, colon without polyps. Follow up colonoscopy after five to 10 years. If a polyp was removed, you can do uh, uh, for follow up after five years. Five years because we know adenoma carcinoma sigmas was five to ten years, so no cancer will develop on f in, in a new polyp. I achieved a, new, uh, a, clear col a clean colon, so I'm supposed to say that this colon is, if he will develop a new polyp, it will be after my colonoscopy achieving the clean colon, so after five years or so, he will not be in the risk of developing carcinoma. Patients with multiple, three or more adenomas are followed up every three years. Why? Because multiple polyps I may be uh, uh, achieving, uh, uh, I think that I have achieved a clean colon, but sometimes a small polyp, I missed one of them, so three years will be safe for him in the follow-up. Benign sessile adenomas less than three centimeter may be removed by piecemeal polypectomy snaring, as we, see, we have seen. But of course, the piecemeal will make it, it for the histopathologist difficult to study the in if there is dysplasia and the invasiveness of these uh, abnormal cells. So it is done only in elderly people who we don't want to do for them a segmental resection for the polyp. If a polyp harbors a villous or serrated pattern or high-grade dysplasia, the follow-up also will be less. It will be in three years. So two cases, we do it in three years, not five years. Those having ma more than three polyps or those having a villous or serrated pattern. H what, how to do polypectomy? This is a colonoscopic polypectomy snare. It goes around uh, uh, we put it and pass it around the head to the pedicle. Then we uh, pass the electric current, press the bottom of the coagulation, and we will snare it like this. And this is the pedicle on the right side, the uh, cauterized pedicle. This is safe, but of course, sometimes uh, bleeding occurs. Uh, in small lesions like that on the left side, we can remove it by a hot biopsy forceps. It is a biopsy forceps, but we can uh, pass an electric current to cauterize it safely. If bleeding occurs after polypectomy, like the right side slide, we can stop it by several maneuver. We can either, these three pictures show the different types of villous lesions, velvety, velvety CSI lesion on the left side, uh, irregular uh, soft lesion and a very, uh, this is in the middle and on that. 
patient with recurrent multiple adenomas limited to one colonic segment every time we find on the, on the sigmoid colon multiple polyps and we remove it of course this can be have another solution we can do for them segmental resection because uh, it is easier and safer for them patient with familial adenomatous polyposis are treated by total proctocolectomy and the G pouch inner anastomosis we remove all the colon harboring mucosa, the poly harboring polyps, so the patient will have no colon, but he will lose the reservoir when we remove the rectum. So we will form a new rectum, a new rectum, we call it a new rectum, by the terminal ileum, by stapling a G pouch, creating a G pouch, so it will be, have, it will have a capacity larger than the normal uh, bowel, a small bowel, and it will help the patient in having less bowel movements than if, uh, uh, if we put it uh, st straight without the pouch. If we do anastomosis directly between the ileum and the anal canal, it is very difficult for him to live because uh, this uh, he will have uh, very frequent uh, 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 bowel motions and diarrhea. But if we, we construct a neorectum by the G pouch and we anastomose this pouch to the anal canal, it will be, uh, he will pass uh, seven to 10 motions per day, which is acceptable for him. Uh, remember that he had either polyposis or ulcer. We do it also in ulcer colitis and he has diarrhea. So seven to 10 times per day for him is acceptable. 9% of polyps harboring invasive cancer will metastasize to regional lymph node. So if you, by histopathology, uh, studying the, uh, the study of the polyps removed, the removed polyp we will find invasive cancer. We have to know that around 9 to 10% will have a, a, a lymph node spread. And the lymphatic involvement increased with some criteria with poor differentiation of the, uh, of the lesion of, uh, of the cancer uh, polyp, malignant polyp. Also, if there is vascular or lymphatic invasion, or if there is invasion below the submucosa, or if there is positive resection margin. So, in malignant colorectal polyps, we have the strategy in management for a polyp harboring moderately or well differentiated carcinoma in the absence of vascular invasion and when clear resection margins are ensured, polypectomy is enough. Okay. Pedunculated malignant polyps with invasion confined to its head only in the absence of other unfavorable factors mentioned in the last slide can be treated by polypectomy alone as long as negative margins are obtained. Of course, follow up should be strict after one year than after three years. Other criteria like stock invasion with favorable histological features. Remember, favorable histological features is very important. So if we have stock invasions with favorable histological features and clear margins also, polypectomy may be enough. Prior to polypectomy, in all cases, especially suspicious lesions, larger than one and a half centimeter or with certain changes on the surface or a villous pattern, we have to perform tattooing at the pedicle site. Before using the uh, snaring and uh, removing the polyp, you, you tattoo it. Why do we do tattooing in the pedicle? Because we have two things. Maybe bleeding will occur and we cannot stop the bleeding uh, by the colonoscopic measures, so we will transfer the patient immediately to the op OR, the operation, and we will do a exploration. If you are, we don't have the tattooing mark for this poly base, so we will not find uh, exactly where to open the colon and to stop the bleeding. But if we inject uh, in Indian ink, which, we, which will make the base of the polyp blue from the serosal surface, we will determine exactly what to do and where to open and to stop the bleeding uh, precisely. Also, if the polyp proved to have invasive cancer and it is of uh, uh, unfavorable histological features and the resection is mandatory, so we, we can do 
laparoscopic resection in after one or two days of this col uh, colonoscopy to do to remove the colon uh, the seg colonic segment with the uh, draining lymph node areas to have a good cancer surgery uh, uh, marked uh, planned around the uh, tattooed segment of the polyp if there is no tattooing mark we will not uh, be able to know which part to remove close surveillance by colonoscopy for all patients with the malignant polyps should be done uh, malignant polyp treated by polypectomy. We, we have the plan now. Uh, I, as I mentioned, five years is good for uh, the rem after removal of one or two polyps, three years after removing of multiple polyps, and three years, every three years after uh, removing the uh, polyps with severe, with severe dysplasia. But after one year, if you remove a polyp with malignant uh, uh, um, criteria, like we mentioned now. In conclusion, the neoplastic polyps are precancerous and should be removed by polypectomy or resection. Okay? Polypectomy is safe with expert endoscopists in certain criteria. Segmental resection is indicated if the removed polyp harbors invasive cancer. Polypectomy may be enough if invasion is limited to the head or the neck of the polyp. Close colonoscopic surveillance after polypectomy is mandatory, and I told you the surveillance strategy plan. Once diagnosed, a yearly colonoscopy to remove big polyps still th in the familiar polyposis uh, patient, the uh, familial adenomatous polyposis uh, uh, patient, once diagnosed, a yearly colonoscopy to remove big polyps till the age of 20 to 25 years or till marriage. So we do yearly colonoscopy after puberty, after 14 years, then we remove the risky polyp the polyps, the, the suspicious polyps, which are the biggest ones, till marriage or till 25 years of age. The ideal operation is the total proctocolectomy and either pouch in anastomosis. Usually it is done in two stages, and this operation is done for familial polyposis coli and for ulcer colitis. Upper gastrointestinal endoscopy should determine it should be done and it will determine gastric and duodenal involvement what are these involvement because in certain polyposis cases and uh, syndromes there is polyps in the stomach polyps in the duodenum and polyps in the small intestine this is very common and also it is common in Pudgeger syndrome screening of the family should be done and polypos polyposis registry should include all the information about the families with familiar polyposis to put a plan for the treating all the members of the family. Thank you.